I'm not sure I can speak into this microphone, but anyway, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Thomas Curran, and I'm one of the founders of Ori. And today I wanted to help you understand how to design and build modern open source software in Go. Um, of course, there's lots of stuff we could discuss. So this is going to be about 20 or 30 slides of pretty dense material. Most of it will be easy to understand. And if it's not, we have some time for questions at the end. Uh, maybe one or two things about myself, and then we'll dive into it. Um, I came to Berlin in 1982 as a graduate student, worked for the German government science center. Um, they didn't have a computer at the time, so I moved to the university in Berlin, Technical University, and taught compilers for two years at uh, the university and then left and did uh, one software company as sort of a side project that was written in assembler that was sort of a pain. And then the next one was a port of a um, not open source, but GNU uh, product called RCS. And that was one of the first real sort of open source type of contracts. Of course, it was a GNU contract and that was ported to Microsoft Windows. And that was also a mess. But um, since then, I've been doing software in small companies that usually got acquired or sold, and then larger companies like Deutsche Telekom, SAP, Microsoft, um, did I leave anyone out, Bertelsmann, etc. So my background is really just in software. And the re I'll just keep on to this. <laughs> I have to do both at once. So how to build and design software. So I want to talk a little bit, first of all, about why. What is Ori? Does anyone know Ori in this room? A couple of people have even probably used it. That's great. Thank you very much. We love that. Uh, we're the largest open source community, really, for cloud applications of authorization, authentication, permissions, ID management. And we have about 200 other repositories. I won't go into them. Some of them are really neat. If you want to look at our X repository, that's where a lot of our tools are. Um, of course, we have quite a lot of contributors. And some of the real good ones live and work in this building. So thank you, sum up people, wherever you are. Um, so Ori is a, first of all, set of open source software libraries, you could say. It's all API first, cloud native type of architecture. But Ori Network is our, what I would say, composite application that we built. It's got all the stuff engineers love. It's globally distributed. It has all kinds of database things going on with it. Of course, we do all the login. You can think of it as one big login infrastructure designed for 100 million simultaneous logins a day. So that's what Ori is. And um, that's what we do in, the, in our product space. But I want to go into what we do also operating as a company. So just in the first three minutes here, you have seen about 6.3 million API calls into the Ori network infrastructure. And we do about nowadays 3 billion um, calls a day. And that grew by about a billion over the last year. So it's a pretty good growth rate. And these are distributed across the globe. Um, big companies like SumUp, Klarna, uh, Tesla, and a lot of others that are using Ori. We have all that information on the website if you're interested. Uh, what I want to talk to about it today, first of all, is why did we start Ori and some of the learnings that we got out of taking to go. Background for most of you here, um, I was CTO at Hybris before this uh, Ori project started, and we had a monster enterprise Java application that was hard to test. It was not very easy to maintain. Uh, we had a lot of trouble onboarding developers because it was highly complex. It needed a virtual machine, and we didn't like any of that for the cloud. So we wanted to get something that had compiled down binaries and was very secure. And that's why we started looking at Go in 2014. It was pretty young at the time. And then um, the reason we got into OAuth as a system was really service-to-service -service authorization. And we decided to make that open source. We made a lot of mistakes along the way. And part of today's discussion is just about how to avoid making those. Just be very clear 
when you start off an open source project, what you want to achieve. Um, we always say in Bori, start with the end in mind. It's very important to think about the target audience. We had one single audience uh, for Ori when we started, and it was Go programmers. Uh, they were usually using GitHub, and they were looking for a library that did OAuth, and that was our only thing we wanted to achieve. And we implemented OAuth right out of the book, right out of the IETF RFCs, and um, there's no real big innovation in of itself, but I think the interesting thing was figuring out how people wanted to use it. And by the way, just to be clear, uh, our first product was even a low level implementation of OAuth. And then we wrote a reference implementation called Hydra after that. Very important for open source, you have to choose your, I would say in commercial terms, go to market. In other words, you'll have an audience that's either uh, looking to have a very free and liberal type of license. We chose uh, Apache 2.0, but of course you have many different options. And again, when you're thinking about the scope, over time you may be interested in commercializing software that is open source. There's a lot of paths to do that, but this is a very important decision. Personally, I would recommend sticking with Apache unless you have the most innovative product in the world and you're worried about someone uh, running it better than you. That happens, but it's not very common. Uh, you have to think about setting up a repository. It has to be easy to understand. People have to get a very clear understanding of what you're doing quickly when they come into GitHub, just because there's tons of other projects, even today, that do similar things. So writing a very good readme, having it structured, and explaining to people how to contribute, those are very key essentials in the repository structure. Take a look at Ori, any of our projects, they're all set up in a way that makes it pretty easy um, to understand how to make a contribution. You also need an architecture that's also, I would say, modern enough and maybe progressive enough to get people interested in working on it. Uh, we chose, you know, 12-factor cloud-native type of design in the beginning because we had that problem ourselves, and we thought a lot of other Go programmers had similar problems. But I would say in today's architecture of what we do at Ori, we had no concept at the time that we would ever end up running you know, a global um, infrastructure based on our open source software. So any architecture that we could have come up with would have probably been wrong. But in the beginning, we had a very clear architecture for what we wanted to achieve with each and every library. Uh, it's also very important to communicate what you want to achieve in what time frame, right? So you need a roadmap, and this is really a good way to signal out to other developers hey, we'll be looking for this and this type of function at a certain point in time. Um, it also gives them the ability to plan. A lot of people are worried about, hey, I don't want to do this. Someone else might be working on it. And communicating also sort of not ownership, but uh, participation in certain roadmap blocks is also, I think, very important. Um, we use GitHub projects. We tend to be very lean in terms of tooling, also important for open source, you don't want to add a lot of different tools, Jira and everything else out there to make sure that developers can easily manage with one tool what they need. Of course, you need a compiler as well, and we'll go into that. So what are some of the important things when you're thinking about making a contribution? <laughs> Actually, when I wrote this the other day, I thought a lot of this isn't even in our repository, but it should be. And you have some very good uh, teams, for instance, a team at Uber, also an Ori user. They, um, they wrote a very good sort of standard implementation guideline for developing in Go. And some of the things here today are just borrowed also from that. Um, of course, how you write code, one of the big advantages of, of Go as a language is it's readable. It should be easy to get into, but there's still a lot of mistakes you can make. Take a camel case or something similar very early on and decide what coding standard you want to have. Um, this implies a lot of different things when you're reading the code. And of course, I think all of you that are Go developers understand, you know, it has to be, it has to be easy to get into and easy to read. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time from other people on trying to understand how to contribute to your project. And um, 
that's very important, I think, in terms of the overall notational character of a project. You want to also think a lot about how to do the good things in Go, right? The structs and interfaces, make them very easy to understand. Uh, I think this is something that we spent also quite a lot of time on, by the way, making our project uh, functions and methods very similar. We want to make sure that these things are completely readable and understandable for anyone that's looking at the project. And by the way, as it grows, 2014, it was easy to contribute to Ori. Now it's millions of lines of code, and getting into that is extremely difficult for anyone that um, is programming even every day. But making it easier and stepping that clarity up is very important. Again, similar, um, you want to have very clear descriptors, and especially with constants and variables, have things that appeal to the person's um, curiosity about what it does. And I think this is, again, takes a lot of refactoring over time. And in the beginning, I think you'll always make some decision that you'll have to go back and change because it turns out to be less readable. But we spent quite a lot of time on that at Ori. And I think in general, this vernacular of the Ori system became very important over the last couple of years when we got smaller contributions, but more important types of contributions over time, package names, try to use these conventions that we use to make it easy for people to understand what it is they're looking at, right? So package name. And also in the repository, um, use something like an internal path to have the things that stay in the repository uh, protected. So that's pretty important, I think. Um, enumeration and custom types. Again, here's a lot of things you can do that make it simpler to easier to understand. I think, um, again, very explicit naming is here very important. Uh, I really don't like uh, <laughs> this type of variables you see at the bottom here because it's just really overkill for what you want to achieve and making it very simple for the maintainers to, to really review code is important to keep things really clear don't make it too complicated, but also don't oversimplify it because these are things that you know carry through the whole program. You'll have a lot of things to do with um, you know simple things. If it's URL, capitalize it. Um, things that make it very again easy to follow what's going on in the code base itself. Typical reviews, even today in Ori, you know they take hours of a maintainer's time. So making these things um, easy. And again, here, meaningful names, things that give you more of a signal, what's going on in the code. That's something that really adds a lot of what I find purpose to what you produce. Um, setting all this stuff up and maintaining a code base, like I said, millions of lines of code makes these things very popular. Um, a lot of Go is about testing and especially catching errors. Uh, that's a really big, important part of the language. Uh, we have a very uh, expansive testing infrastructure because we're in security software. And then making these things um, easy to understand, again, when you're talking about error and catching errors, I think this is something that has to be extremely descriptive. Um, doesn't have to be overcooked, right? Uh, same thing for receivers. Now, if it's a file, make it easy to, say, to document what it's doing. Uh, if you're catching things, uh, uh, at a receptor, it should also be clear why it's done. And I think those are things that you can build easily into your, um, into your code and into your contributions. But again, having something this clear helps all developers um, understand how to write the code that will make it, their contribution meaningful and easy to merge into any of the projects. Uh, Ori is big on collaboration. Uh, we have thousands of contributors across the world. I mean, everywhere uh, people are contributing to Ori, but it's also a lot of work. I want to introduce two people in the room today. One is Vincent. Vincent, can you just wave? And Hayato. Hayato's over there. These two guys are with me here today, and they're really working on developer contributions, but also the developer community and helping 
people answer questions. Of course, we get lots of questions about the implementation scenarios, but also just basically communicating what we do and helping people understand how to use it. Those are very essential things. We use GitHub issues a lot. Um, we also use GitHub discussions. We have a Slack channel. Uh, we had Discourse. We didn't really like it too much at the time. That was about five years ago. We're thinking of opening it up again. Uh, what else? We have, of course, um, our website. We have uh, pretty much, I think, every channel that developers would use to contact us, and we try to manage that all across one um, sort of information plane at Ori. We also have, of course, bots and AI, and uh, Vincent is working on all that stuff. So we help collaboration and try to automate things. Testing, as I mentioned, is a very big part of any open source project. Keep in mind, whatever you produce will be used in many, many places uh, if it's a popular project. So having the test and making the test explicit uh, is very important. And of course, if you're using anything uh, like Playwright or any type of CI tool, we'll get into that, you know, you're going to have to have testing in it anyway. And then really, I think the more you test, the better it gets. And that's certainly what we try to implement and um, institutionalize before accepting any uh, pull requests. So that's very important for us. I would also say, by the way, documentation and testing are two essentials for almost any feature that people contribute because um, it's just otherwise hard to really understand even sometimes the intention of things. Um, we use GitHub Actions, we've used Circle CI, we've used probably most of the popular CI tools. Um, again, going back to keeping it very simple, lean tooling, trying to stay in one place, you can do all your stuff in one uh, easy to read and understand infrastructure is pretty important for any open source project and it makes it just comfortable for people to see what's going on. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of information also that we produce around this and you can very easily see if your feature was merged in or if it's um, somehow got a red flag. Writing documentation is probably on the critical path to adoption. Uh, really, there's unfortunately a lot of mysterious coding uh, concepts and things you can do in life, but um, even those can be accepted if it's well documented and explained. And that includes in-code documentation as well as a very clear sort of what the goal is, how you want to achieve it, what the result is, what you expect in terms of output. Those simple things that make it really um, beneficial for everyone involved. And then merging that documentation in, of course, we get all different kinds of um, versions of English, let's say, where people have different skill sets. And now today you can use ChatGPT or some other tools to help you improve your language. We, we think that's a great boon for open source because people can actually explain a lot better what they're doing and it tends to be in one consistent uh, language. So that's very important also for us when we're providing um, assistance to people online with our own AI tools. Those are very important. Um, you need to have, as I said in the beginning, a very good for the project, um, but obviously, you know, making releases are decisions that the maintainers mostly have to have. To have. Uh, we still try to follow a pretty good schedule that we publish six months to a year out. Um, that's considered good practice. Uh, if you look at some of the bigger projects like VS Code or Docker, and Kubernetes, that's the type of time frame you're dealing with. So these tend to be um, important things to communicate. And even in open source, by the way, uh, release management and adoption of even simple things, uh, security patches, uh, it's making it as simple as possible to get the information and understand how to change it is very, very important. Again, just because of the fact that people are using open source doesn't always mean they pay attention to all the maintenance things. Um, in 
open source, we try to also use other open source if possible. It's not always possible, but we tend to look at libraries and other parts of the code base of other products and projects that make it um, easy for us to merge in other open source projects. Probably a good example, most of you have worked with it, I hope, Cobra, and we, we use that for our CLI. Uh, we tend to try to make contributions back if we can. If anyone can fix uh, open a API, I mean, that would be great. We're not, I'm not saying it's a bad open source project, but it's just bad results. Uh, so we're trying to fix some things there and try to look at the overall community aspect and be a part of that community with open source tends to be something that also helps promote your open source project in Go. And I think it's, you know, Go has quite a lot of very good open source uh, products out there. Getting adoption with companies or people that are working companies, it's very important to have some type of compliance and security. Also a reporting infrastructure in case something does go wrong, you need to patch something. Uh, all of this uh, is extremely critical and it helps the adoption a lot. Uh, I can promise you that because Ori has seen this over the years. Um, simple things, you know, I could mention even a few. GDPR as an example, if you want to look at data and identity management systems, um, security patches, security newsletters. We work in our project with many types of other external tools for checking the license compliance. Uh, we work with HackerOne, the platform. Any of you that are interested, of course, can sign up and try to find bugs and worry. You get money for that, and that's a good thing. And of course, we also work with code scanning and other tools just to make sure um, we have a, uh, a clean code base that companies can rely on. And that's also important for adaptation. Um, it's really all about the community. And like I said in the beginning, having people dedicated and focused on the community is a big part of any open source project. Even it doesn't matter if you're the best programmer on the planet. Um, if you don't have a community, your open source project will suffer because it's all going to be one-sided. You won't get peer reviews. It won't take off because people will be nervous about being able to bet on the future of this project. The bigger the community, the more security the adaptation has of it. Now, I also think there's a lot of different styles of community. Ori is, prides itself in being a friendly company and a friendly community. You know, we don't write hate mails to people and tell them to shut up, but we do have a community code of conduct, and that's very important to maintain because, of course, also not only diversity, but also all kinds of other kinds of communication that can take place in any community. You need to police that, and it needs to be very clear for everyone in the community how it works. So I think that's um, an important part of the, the, what I would call the culture of any open source project. So you want to maintain that and build on that. Um, there are tons of resources. I just mentioned a few here. Of course, um, shame on you if you're still using Eclipse, but there's a lot of good products for Go programmers today. The industry is just really boomed even though I think there's still a lot more that can happen with Copilot, et cetera. Um, we see, even for our own projects, a lot of opportunities to use new API, uh, AI tools. And uh, we think this is one of the things that will really help open source grow even faster and stronger. Uh, one of our adopters is OpenAI, so of course we're looking very carefully at what they're doing and they're helping us integrate some of their technology into our Ori products, and that's going to be, I think, a big advancement in 2024. Uh, 20, uh, we also have a blog, we publish things. We just published a whole article yesterday on Ori Network. I encourage you to take a look at it if you're interested in um, large-scale engineering using Go. We have a lot of stuff to talk about there. And of course, we also have different websites and other places where you can find out information. We have the Ori Summit once a year. This is the place where people come and hang out, not only for talking about code and contributions. We, of course, also talk to people that are big adopters and what they're doing. And uh, I think one year, maybe last year, some, no, year before, SumUp was also there as a company and talking about what they're, they're using Ori for in this building 
And um, I encourage you to think about coming to Munich if you're really interested in this type of work and meeting the other developers. We have quite a few that are also pretty famous, I would say, in the space. So it's a very good community event, and we hope to see you there. Our website is ori.sh. Don't ask me why we picked SH, but we did at the time. We think it's sort of cool, but um, if you want to talk to me, you can write me an email or join our Slack community, and uh, hopefully we um, can help you answer questions, not only about Ori, but like I said, how to build a project like this. <clears throat>